Welcome to another tutorial video. This time we're going to be going through some sample interview questions and answers related to leverage buyouts and LBO models. So a typical question that we get on this topic goes something like this. If I don't have much of a finance background, how much do I need to know about LBO models and interviews? Should I expect case studies or modeling tests? And how quickly should I be able to build a model? The short answer to these types of questions is that LBO related questions could definitely come up, but case studies are not terribly likely except for private equity interviews or if you have more experience and you're going for more advanced roles within investment banking. One trend recently is that interviewers have been asking more difficult questions on the fundamentals. And in this context, what it really means is giving you a trickier or more complicated scenario and asking you to approximate the internal rate of return or the IRR in an LBO. Another point is that interviewers have begun to ask you more of a progression of questions on the same topic or the same scenario to see how much you know. And they'll keep asking more and more difficult questions until you reach your limit and you can no longer answer the questions. And then finally, although people freak out sometimes over complex case studies, very simple ones and short tests with basic numbers are actually far more common. Even in private equity interviews, yes, Longer case studies will come up, especially as you approach the finish line and you get to the final round of interviews. But before that, in initial rounds, they're still gonna ask you to do the quick math for LBOs and to determine whether or not, at a glance, a deal might work. So here's a typical progression of questions that you might get related to LBO models in interviews. First, you might be asked to walk through a basic model and to explain why the math works. Then they might ask you about what makes for an ideal LBO candidate and what types of qualities you would look for. Then they might get into math questions and ask you to approximate the IRR if certain conditions are true. They might ask you what purchase multiple or EBITDA growth are required to realize a certain IRR. And then they might also ask you to approximate the IRR in a more unusual scenario, such as an IPO exit or a dividend recap or something else like that, as opposed to the standard M&A exit in a leverage buyout. So let's go through all these questions and learn what you might say and how you might present them. For this first one, can you walk me through a basic LBO model and explain why the math works? You could say something like this. In a leverage buyout, a private equity firm acquires a company using a combination of debt and equity, operates it for several years, and then sells it. The math works because leverage amplifies returns. The PE firm earns a higher return if the deal does well because it uses less of its own money up front. And you should know that if you've been through any of our other material on this topic, that yes, if a deal performs reasonably well, then using say 70% debt might boost the IRR from eight or 9% up to 15 or 16%. But if the deal doesn't do so well, let's say that we have to sell the company at a discount to the initial purchase price at the end, then leverage is gonna make us do even worse. We go from a 3.3% IRR down to a negative 1.3% IRR with leverage. So that's the key point to keep in mind that leverage amplifies returns and PE firms always, of course, try to go for positive returns, in which case leverage will help them. Now to walk through the LBO model, step one is you have to make assumptions for the purchase price, the debt and equity, the interest rate on debt, and then revenue growth, margins, and other operational assumptions. We have an example of it right here in this model for seven days in. We've made some assumptions for the purchase price based on various multiples. And then also for the debt that's being used in the deal, the senior notes and subordinate notes here. Step two is to create a sources and uses schedule to figure out how much an investor equity the private equity firm has to pay. And we have that down here. There's a rollover in this deal and so the private equity firm has to pay for the shares of the company. It uses debt to fund some of that. And then the fact that it has this rollover and the fact that existing investors are coming in reduces how much money the private equity firm has to pay. Once you have that, then you can adjust the company's balance sheet for the new debt and equity issued, and then also for any goodwill created and any other acquisition effects. Then in step four, you project the company's statements or at least its cash flow, and you figure out how much debt it can repay each year. So here, for example, we don't have a full set of financial statements for this company seven days in, but we do have an income statement. And then we have a partial cash flow statement that at least lets us get how much cash flow the company has available for debt repayment each year. And those are the most important parts. 
Then once we figured out the cash flow and the debt repayment and what EBITDA and cash flow the company gets up to by the end, we make assumptions about the exit. So here, for example, we have assumed that the exit multiple is the same as the purchase multiple, and we calculate the money on money multiple and the IRR based on that. Those are the basic steps in a leverage buyout model. That's probably the most basic question you will get on leverage buyouts. A slightly more advanced question is this one about ideal leverage buyout candidates. What makes for an ideal LBO candidate? There are many factors you could list, but the most important ones are the following. First off, price. Almost any deal and almost any leverage buyout can work at the right price, but if the company is too expensive, the chances of failure are quite high. If a company is relatively cheap and undervalued next to similar companies, you can have a lot of trouble and perhaps an exit that doesn't go so well, but if you didn't pay that much for it in the beginning and you got a bargain on the deal, then the math might still work quite well. But if you pay a very high multiple for a company and it's possibly overvalued, then even one small thing going wrong can completely ruin the deal. So the price is probably the most important part. After that, stable and predictable cash flows are important because all companies in leverage buyouts have to pay interest on debt and then have to repay the debt principal, possibly over time, possibly just at the end. But regardless of what happens, stable cash flows are very, very important. Related to cash flows are the need for ongoing capital expenditures and other big investments, and then possibly room to expand margins over time. Generally speaking, if a company has to spend a lot to fund its growth in the form of new factories, equipment, working capital, things like that, it's less of an ideal candidate. Also, if there's a way to improve its margins and therefore improve its cash flow, that makes it a better LBO candidate. And then finally, there has to be a realistic path to exit. And that means a market with active buyers and sellers. That means a market where it's possible to take the company public if the PE firm goes down that path. And you also want the returns to be driven mostly by EBITDA growth and debt paydown instead of multiple expansion. So in this model for seven days in, for example, 68% of the returns come from EBITDA growth and 32% from debt paydown and cash generation, which is exactly what we want to see. If this deal were predicated on multiple expansion and the numbers only worked if the EBITDA multiple increased to 10x or 12x or 15x, we'd be a whole lot more skeptical of this deal. So you almost always want to see realistic exit assumptions and a market where it's possible to sell the company or take it public in the future. So those are a few of the basic questions you can get on this topic. If you get those right, the interviewer will probably start going into more advanced questions and get into some of the math around leverage buyouts. Now, with these math questions, to approximate the IRR, you can always take the relevant percentage, 100%, 200%, 300%, divide it by the number of years in the period, and then multiply it by some smaller percentage to account for the effect of compounding. So if you double your money, you could take 100% divide by the number of years and multiply by around 75% to get to the IRR. If you triple your money, it's 200% divided by the number of years and then you multiply by around 65%, you can round that to about two thirds to get the IRR. And then if you quadruple your money, it's 300% divided by the number of years and you can multiply by 55% to get the approximate IRR. The key is that you need to figure out the initial investor equity and then the exit equity proceeds. If you have both of those and the number of years, you can always get to the IRR. A few simple examples of this rule are that if you double your money in three years, it's around a 25 or 26% IRR. And if you double your money in five years, it's around a 15% IRR. And then if you triple your money in three years, it's around a 44 or 45% IRR. And if you do it in five years, it's around a 25% IRR. So let's look at a simple example of a question related to this topic. A PE firm acquires a 100 million EBITDA company for a 10x EBITDA multiple using 60% debt. The company's EBITDA grows to 150 million by year five, but the exit multiple drops to 9x. The company repays 250 million of debt and generates no extra cash. What is the IRR? So once again, you need to know the initial investor equity, the exit equity proceeds, and then the number of years in the period. In this case, it's pretty simple because we know it is a five-year holding period, and we can easily get to the initial investor equity. The initial investor equity is just the 100 million of EBITDA times this 10x multiple 
And then we know they're using 60% debt, which means they're using 40% equity. So 100 million times 10 times 40% is 400 million. Now the exit enterprise value, we know that EBITDA grows to 150 million and we know the multiple drops to 9x. So 150 million times nine is 1,350 million or 1.35 billion. Of course, the PE firm doesn't get all that. It has to repay the remaining debt at the end. Now the debt remaining on exit, we know is equal to the 60% times that upfront purchase price, so 600 million. And then the instructions say that the company repays 250 million, which leaves us with 350 million at the end. So putting those together, the exit equity proceeds are just the exit enterprise value of 1.35 billion minus the remaining debt of 350 million, and we get to 1 billion like that for our exit equity proceeds. 1 billion divided by 400 million is a 2.5x multiple. We know that a 2x multiple over five years is about a 15% IRR, and a 3x multiple over five years is about a 25% IRR. So we would approximate this one as around 20%. In Excel, you can enter this yourself, and you can say negative 400, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1,000. And you can take the IRR like this, and you get to exactly 20%. So if you get this kind of question right, they will throw something harder your way and ask you to back solve for one of the key assumptions. Here's an example. You buy 100 EBITDA business for a 10X multiple and you believe you can sell it again in five years for 10X EBITDA. You use 5X debt to EBITDA to fund the deal and the company repays 50% of that debt over five years, generating no extra cash. How much EBITDA growth do you need to realize a 20% IRR? So once again, we need the initial equity, the equity proceeds, and the number of years. We know it's a five-year holding period, and the initial investor equity is pretty easy to get because we know how much debt we're using, we know the EBITDA, we know the multiple in the beginning. So the initial investor equity here is the 100 EBITDA times this 10x multiple, and then 5x debt to EBITDA means that about 50% of the price will be funded with equity. So multiplying all those gives us 500. And then for the exit, we know that a 20% IRR over five years is around a 2.5X multiple from the last question. 2X is 15%, 3X is 25%. So 2.5X is right in between those and that should give us around 20%. This means that we need to get to 1.25 billion in equity proceeds to get this 20% IRR over five years. Now, we know that the PE firm used 500 of debt here in the beginning because five times 100 of EBITDA is 500 of debt. The company repays 50% of it, which means that there is 250 left at the end, which means that we need to sell this company for an exit enterprise value of 1,500. If we do that, we will end up with this 1,250 in equity proceeds. We know that we can sell the company at the end for 10X EBITDA so 1,500 divided by 10 is 150. And you can go into Excel and verify this one for yourself as well, but that's how we might work backwards to get this figure. Now, if you get that right, then they might give you an even harder question, which is how to approximate IRR in an IPO exit. So a simple question here might be, a PE firm acquires a 200 EBITDA company for an 8X multiple using 50% debt. The company's EBITDA increases to 240 over three years and it repays all the initial debt. The PE firm takes it public and sells off its stake evenly over three years at a 10X multiple. What is the IRR? So in this case, the initial investor equity is easy because 200 EBITDA times eight times 50% gives us 800. Now the exit enterprise value is just the 240 times the 10X multiple which is 2,400 here. We know the company repays all the initial debt. So the exit equity proceeds are actually the same as the exit enterprise value in this case. We're assuming no cash or anything like that. Now the tricky part here is figuring out how many years it takes to exit. If the private equity firm sells off one third in year three, 
one third in year four, and then one third in year five, the average number of years to exit is four. This is a triple our money scenario because we get back 2,400 and we put in 800 in the beginning. And we know that tripling our money over three years is around a 45% IRR and tripling our money over five years is around a 25% IRR. So we could use something in the middle of that range and we could say the approximate IRR here is 35%. This one is actually off a little bit. If you go into Excel and do the math yourself, if we put in 800 in the beginning and we get back 800 each year, the IRR actually comes out to 32% for this scenario. So we're a little bit off. And that's because of the fact that it took us three years to completely exit our stake in this company. Nevertheless, our approximation isn't that far off. 35% is decently close to 32%. And at least we know the rough range of the IRR in this deal. So those are a few examples of LBO model interview questions. Let's do a recap and summary now. The most important point on this topic is that you have to understand the intuition behind an LBO, what makes for good buyout candidates, how to walk through a simple LBO model, and so on and so forth. With the math questions, you can always approximate the IRR if you know the multiple and the number of years in the holding period. What this means is that the three key variables are the initial investor equity, the exit equity proceeds, and the number of years. If you have all those, you can always come up with some kind of estimate for the internal rate of return. If they give you a variation of this type of question and they ask you for something like the purchase multiple or the EBITDA, if you're targeting a certain IRR or targeting certain multiple, you can always back into those assuming that you have all the other information. The way to think about it is that it's just one equation with a single variable. And if there's just one single unknown, you can always solve that equation to get that unknown. For more unusual scenarios like IPO exits or dividend recaps, think about the average year in which you receive the equity proceeds and use that to do all your math. And then finally, remember that these tricks work well for standard situations, such as selling a company after three years or five years or seven years, but they stop working as well if it's a very short holding period, like one year or two years, and also stop working well for very long holding periods, like 12 years or 15 years, or cases where the exit takes a very long time, such as four years, five years, six years. So be aware of these tricks and use them as much as you can, but also be aware of their limits and understand why they may not necessarily match up with the results you get in real life. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about LBO modeling interview questions, what to expect, and how to do some of the math and quick approximations that might be expected of you in interviews.